All right, welcome back, everybody. I went and saw Avengers Infinity War. Let's talk a little bit about it. I wasn't in a huge hurry to go see this, but I figured the longer I waited, the better chances I would have something totally ruined for me by scumbags on the internet, so I went and saw it. Let's get into it, shall we? Now, there will be a ton of spoilers for this, because this is going to be kind of a breakdown. I'm, I didn't write anything down, and I only saw it once, so we're kind of just going to go off of my memory here. So if I get certain scenes or something out of sequence, my bad. There's, this movie jumps around all over the damn place. I took my eight-year-old son and his best friend to go see it, and it's let's just say this movie is very freaking grim. I mean, obviously, you, you saw it or you wouldn't be watching this, so you know it's very grim and sad, and a lot of beloved characters seemingly meet their end, some of them most definitely. So we start off with a ship under siege. It's not immediately clear to me whose ship it is. We're greeted to a voiceover by somebody who sounds evil. Uh, basically exposition for the story so we can know what Thanos is all about. As he's stepping over dead bodies and we see the big hulking mass of Thanos and he's carrying a, a lifeless body with him. Suddenly it comes into focus and we realize he's carrying freaking Thor. So and it's at that point that I realize that they're on the ship that Thor and his people escaped from when Asgard blew up at the end of uh, Thor Ragnarok. So you know, you're like, oh my god, these are all the dead Asgardians that he's stepping all over? What the hell, man? Loki starts speaking, and he appears to attempt to make a deal with Thanos, but uh, he, he gets to chime in with that famous line that Tony got to say in the first one by saying, we have a Hulk. Suddenly, Hulk comes out of nowhere and just freaking levels Thanos right to the freaking chin, and right out the gate, it's pretty freaking awesome. We're treated to Hulk versus Thanos in the opening couple minutes of this movie. Thanos, having enough of this, decides to turn the ass-kicking tables on Hulk and delivers an insane punch right to Hulk's throat, which you hear him... Like, yelp. Like a, like a, yelp. <laughs> like, like, we never heard Hulk in, like, serious pain like that, I don't think. It was pretty insane. And then, all of a sudden, Thanos just unleashes with the freaking brutal combos and haymakers and uppercuts. And he just works Hulk down and just beats him into a crumbling mess. The uh, Hulk's laying there just completely beating the crap out of. <laughs> and uh, Thor jumps in and starts swinging on him. And they're all just getting decimated. Loki gets dropped. Uh, and it's not looking good for our heroes. Not one bit. Right when it seems all is lost, uh, Loki summons some sort of portal over Hulk and just shoots him hurtling through space. We see poor Hemdall, Stringer Bell himself, laying there beaten and bloodied, and Thanos moves over to him and asks for the information he wants, and Hemdall being the man and all is not going to give it to him, so Thanos freaking kills Hemdall. Thanos grabs Thor into a Hulkish bear grip right by his neck, and he is threatening to kill Thor if Loki doesn't tell him where the stone is that he's looking for. Thor tells Thanos that it's gone, it died when Asgard died, and Loki informs him that that's not exactly true, being the trickster that he is, he actually stole it and has it on him, he makes it appear out of thin air, and gives it to Thanos, uh, Thanos decides to spare Thor's life. Loki tries to pull a fast one on Thanos, but Thanos catches it and grabs Loki by the neck with his Infinity Gauntlet and squeezes until Loki's eyes pop out of his head and his tongue sticks out. He turns purplish red, looking like Joffrey from the Purple Wedding, actually. And freaking croaks. Loki dies within the opening minutes of this movie. And I think he's really dead this time. Even Thanos makes a reference saying no more resurrection. So I think getting choked out by the Infinity Gauntlet may just do the trick this time. Four and a half minutes into this movie and we're already whacking majorly established Marvel characters. Thor gets incapacitated at this point by one of Thanos' minion guys who is able to warp and manipulate physical matter and he kind of wraps Thor up in some metal stuff, even seals Thor's mouth so he would stop talking. Thanos then sends his minions, who we come to find out are the children of Thanos, out to their, uh, their next destination to go find the next stones that he needs. Uh, and as his way, and on his way out... Thanos uh, takes the liberty of destroying the ship Thor's on with Thor on it, and it all blows to hell. Around this time, we go to Doctor Strange and his buddy Wong, and they're chatting in their little hideout area, and suddenly they hear a noise and a crashing through the big, giant, iconic glass window that Doctor Strange has, right through the staircase, and they notice that it's Hulk, and he's starting to slowly shift back into Bruce Banner, who looks terrified and tells him that Thanos is coming. I believe this is where we get our first title marker of the movie. Uh, then we go to Tony Stark and Pepper Potts walking through Central Park. He's telling her about a dream that he had, that they had a baby. Uh, he wants to name the baby Morgan. Uh, some diehard fans will know that Morgan is the name of Tony Stark's cousin in the comics, who's a big thorn in his side. 
So it's interesting that he chose that name for his baby. Before you know it, Doctor Strange's orange portal pops up and he shows up and he tells Tony that, look, the fate of the world literally lies in the balance. Tony doesn't believe him until Bruce steps up from behind Doctor Strange and tells him, look, this is really going on. Thanos is a danger. Uh, he tells Tony to call Steve, and then that's that point that Tony tells Bruce that he's missed a lot, you know, like that whole Civil War thing that happened. No sooner do they even get the warning do they start to hear the world ending outside. They go out there just in time to see this large O-ring-shaped donut ship that's entering the atmosphere and sending everybody running and screaming. We get that scene from the trailer of Peter Parker riding on the bus where his spider t- senses start tingling and his hair stands up on his arm. And we get our obligatory Stan Lee cameo out of the way, where he ribs the kids about never seeing a spaceship before. Parker makes his exit, donning a spider suit and whizzes into action. Back to the commotion on the streets with Doctor Strange and Tony Stark, we see that Thanos' children have arrived and they confront the group on the streets. We see the bad guy from earlier who can manipulate objects. His name is Ebony Maw, and he's telling them how lucky they are that Thanos is coming to purge them and make their world better. Tony hilariously tells them that they're closed. Uh, it was about this point that uh, Tony is trying to get Bruce to turn into the big green guy, but uh, Bruce is having some sort of trouble uh, conjuring him up, to it, which uh, Tony tells him, come on, you're embarrassing me in front of the wizards. It was, it was pretty damn funny. So for some reason, Hulk's unable to pop up and help out. So the fight happens, and we really get to see what this Ebony Maw guy can do. And to me, I think he was one of the best parts of this movie because, I mean, he was just you know real confident, just real smarmy, and he was just able to just cut anything in half and just, just do whatever he wanted. And he was definitely giving them a run for their money. The, uh, the giant guy, whose name is uh, Cole Obsidian, I'm told, had a really crazy hammer that he was able to launch the head off of it and retract it back on a cable, causing a lot of destruction, too. And as they're getting their butts handed to him by these new bad guys, and it seems all is lost, Spider-Man shows up and helps him out. So about that time, the, one of the O-ring ships takes off, uh, and the bad guys are on it, and Spider-Man web whips onto it and kind of sticks to it as it's taken off into atmosphere, and we get a we get a view of one of Tony Stark's new features that he can do when he can basically have his legs form one giant repulsor rocket engine, and it shoots him flying up into the freaking ship. So Spider-Man's hanging onto the side of the ship, losing oxygen, and he slides off just in time for Tony to give him back the iron spider suit that Spider-Man pretty much denied at the end of Homecoming. Tony boards the alien vessel, thinking Spider-Man fell safely back to Earth, not knowing that Spider-Man actually held on to the ship and is making the trip with him. I think it was around this point where I got one of my favorite cutaways of the movie where it just it shows a nice shot of outer space and then just where it normally tells you where it's at, it just says space. <laughs> and just from this abrupt turn into direct campiness, I immediately knew that this would be the introduction to the Guardians of the Galaxy in this. I mean, we already knew they were going to be in it from the trailer, but that just dorkiness of saying space when it's obviously space could only mean one thing. We get one of their normal old rock montages as they're flying through space, and we find out they're actually uh, heading to a distress beacon signal that they picked up. When they get there, they arrive and are flying through debris of what turns out is Thor's destroyed ship. Uh, As there's bodies and and parts of the ship all around them, suddenly they make contact and Thor flies into their windshield, scaring all of them to death. And uh, Rocket's freaking out, telling them to hit the wi- hit the wipers, hit the wipers, get it off. <laughs> uh, and they see that Thor's eye opens and realize he's alive, and uh, they bring him onto the ship to analyze him. Uh, as they quickly realize he's not normal, Star Lord says he's just a dude. To which Drax replies, "He's not a dude. You're a dude. He's a man." <laughs> just the the jokes just keep coming in this freaking movie. I swear. Thor awakens and gives them the lowdown of what's going on. It's around there, him and Rocket and Groot decide to board one of the pods and go off on their own separate way. They are heading on their own special mission for Thor. Meanwhile, everybody else on the ship is heading on their own mission to go to Nowhere, the last known location of the Collector who is holding one of the Infinity Stones. It's around this time where we catch up with Scarlet Witch and Vision. They're on their like weird European vacation getaway or something. Uh, Vision's looking a lot more like Paul Bettany these days, I noticed. They're having their nice little stroll, and then suddenly Vision gets stabbed in the freaking chest. One of those crazy dudes from the beginning, who I'm told now is Corvus Glaive, shanked Vision right in the back with that giant glaive weapon of doom that he has. Scarlet Witch and that evil lady with the spear square off. I'm told her name is Proxima Midnight, and apparently her spear is something that you don't want to mess with. 
And just as all is lost and they're both on the receiving end of a near-fatal ass-kicking, everybody's attention is drawn to a shadowy figure. It's kind of homeless-looking Captain America, looking all bearded up. He's not alone, he's got Falcon and Black Widow with him, and they deliver a beatdown to the bad guys. The Glaive guy got wrecked, he couldn't even get up. But they waste just enough time for Scarlet Witch to make a clever quip and the bad guys vanish in thin air. So now Vision's all jacked up and they're being hunted, so Captain America says he's got a good place for them to go. Enter Wakanda. Back on Star-Lord's ship, we had Gamora and Peter Quill talking about Thanos, and she was telling him how he decimated her planet when she was young and kidnapped her to raise her, and and it was a terrible way to grow up. And if he happened to capture her again, then he had to kill her. She made Peter promise he would kill her if Thanos ever captured her, and he agreed. In another hilarious part of the movie, they look over and notice that Drax is just standing there eating out of like a bag of potato chips. And they ask, how long has he been standing there? And he said, one hour. <laughs> he told them that he's mastered the art of being invisible by moving very, very slow. They could have left the joke at that, but they had to go a little too long with it by having Mantis come in and say, hey Drax. So they get to their destination, nowhere, just in time to find the Collector is already being beaten, tortured, and interrogated by Thanos. Quill comes up with a plan of attack, but it gets ruined when Gamora decides to not go right when he told her to go right. But Gamora was actually wrecking Thanos. You know, she even broke a blade off in his neck and then pulled off a sweet stab, and he laid there gargling, saying why, and they were all celebrating too early, obviously. And they found out, of course, it was just an illusion, because Thanos has all these powerful rings now, and he can make all kinds of crazy crap happen. He then turned Drax into a pile of cubes and Mantis into a pile of ribbons. And I wondered at that point, like, are they dead now? He uh, grabbed Gamora and he's backing her into the portal. And she's telling Peter, remember the promise, because remember he promised he'd have to kill her if, if she was being captured by Thanos. You know, and Thanos seemed pretty intrigued by that. So he was daring Peter to do it. Go ahead, do it, do it. Uh, and to Thanos' surprise, Peter actually did it. But, you know, being Thanos, he can change stuff. He had bubbles come out of Peter's gun. Uh, and he smiled and said, I like him, and and pulled her into the portal and left. And it just goes to show you again how just random Thanos is in this. He's not just a complete crazy, insane psycho. You know, he could have just killed everybody because Drax formed back into regular Drax, and so did Mantis. Like, they didn't die, and he could have just left them in chunks and ribbons. And So it's just weird. He just lets people go sometimes. It just makes him a little bit more of an interesting and complex villain, definitely. Picking up with Thor, Groot, and Rocket, they're on their mission, which we find out is Thor trying to get a new weapon made in the same place that Mjolnir was made. It's a forge built in a dying star. Suddenly we're treated to a cameo that I was not aware was going to be in this movie. It's freaking Peter Dinklage. And in this, he's hilariously playing a gigantic dwarf who runs the forge and helps make the weapons and armaments of the Asgardians. The forge is dead and they need to do some really elaborate crap to jumpstart it and get it working again. Thor bravely putting his life on the line to help charge the machine to create his next weapon. And they get what they came for. Dinklage spits him out one hot chunk of metal <laughs> for Thor to make Stormbreaker. He's just missing one vital part, the handle. Teenage Groot seeing an opportunity to be helpful chops off his own arm and offers it as the handle, and they uh, actually get that to work. Back on the O-Ring ship that's headed to Titan, Iron Man quickly realizes that Spider-Man is not safely headed home. He's in fact on the ship with him. But they don't have time to talk long because they're quickly attacked by Ebony Maw. And of course he's just completely destroying them again. Uh, until Peter Parker is reminded of an old movie he remembers called Aliens, and they've used the trick at the end of Aliens uh, to suck the bad guy out into deep space. And that was the last we see of the uh, awesome villain, Ebony Maw, as he got sucked out into the deep space, frozen and glazed over. After chatting and snooping around a little bit on the ship, they notice that somebody is coming and the door is opening. Enter the Guardians of the Galaxy. A fight ensues as nobody knows who to trust, and suddenly they all realize they're after a guy named Thanos. We get to Thanos, who's taking Gamora up to the top of a mountain, and once they get up there, they're greeted by a shadowy, cloaky figure who is telling them where to go and what to do. It's pretty quickly revealed that the shadowy figure is actually, boom, another cameo, Red Skull. 
I myself was pretty surprised by this, but uh, it seemed like a lot of people in my theater didn't see the first Avenger, and I don't think it's one of the most popular ones, so that makes sense. Not to mention, it was like 10 years ago. Nonetheless, my nerd boy fandom was peaking, and I was pretty excited. I grew up reading Captain America comics, and Red Skull was a staple. This new Red Skull, by the way, is clearly not voiced by Hugo Weaving. I'm, I'm guessing they just couldn't get him back, or he just said, I don't want to come back. In fact, I believe he actually did say, I don't want to come back. So the stone that they were there to get was the soul stone. But to get the soul stone, you need to give a soul that you care about. Uh, and this this part, you know, Thanos showing his complexities again starts tearing up. Uh, and Red Skull informs Gamora that he's crying because he knows he has to throw her in there. So her realizing and she starts freaking out. But Thanos grabs her by the arm and slowly walks her off. And it, it's pretty it's pretty messed up. She's absolutely terrified as he throws her over the edge in slow motion. And just so there would be no ambiguity, we were treated to a visual of her crumpled, lifeless, broken body on the rocks below. And Thanos was awarded the Soul Stone for his troubles. So we go back to the O-Ring ship, and it's got Iron Man and Spider-Man, who's Iron Spider at this point, basically. They're still with the remaining members of Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, and they're learning how to crash land this thing on planet Titan. Which they successfully do. It crashes pretty badly. They uh, they all climb out of the wreckage. And I'm pretty sure they see Doctor Strange already waiting for them there. It was around here where Doctor Strange told Tony Stark that he had relived their battle with Thanos over 14 million times using the Time Stone. And there was only one good outcome out of all of them. They start devising a plan and Tony Stark comes up with one that Star-Lord doesn't really like. So they end up going with Star-Lord's plan. This scene is cutting back, actually, to Wakanda also, where it shows them staging for an assault because they know what's coming there also. Because they have Vision there and they're trying to repair him and figure out what they can do about the stone that's stuck in his head. And about that time, these gigantic monolithic things come crashing out of the sky and landing in the forest and uh, they these huge monster things come pouring out of it and they one by one they all start hitting and building up on the force field and Everybody, all the good guys, you know, they're all lo locking and loading and getting ready for the onslaught. And the, they're like mesmerized that these beasts are just pouring through the force field, cutting themselves in half with no regard for their life. You know, once the defenses are broken, the good guys charge at them. You just see this huge swarm of good guys running at them. And uh, the two fastest guys, of course, Black Panther and Captain America, break from the pack in the front. And they're, they're running like 150 miles an hour. It was really freaking cool looking scene, actually. <laughs> And we're treated to a pretty epic battle scene, Braveheart-like, with monsters and superheroes. More people get their time to shine. You know, we got Bruce Banner, who's still unable to conjure the Hulk up, so he's actually rocking the uh, Hulk Buster armor. Uh, and he's, he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big monster with the hammer thing, too. Uh, what was his name? Obsidian. The uh, the big Obsidian monster rips off the Hulkbuster arm, and uh, you think it's, he's pretty much done for, but Bruce, being a smart genius and everything, he decides to wrap the arm, or the booster arm, around the bad guy, and it shoots him up into this the force field that was wrecking all those guys, and like it shoots him up on the inside of it, and he just skips across it until he just disintegrates and explodes. And it was a pretty epic send off to that bad guy. So back on Titan, Thanos shows up, and an insane knockdown, drag out, epic set piece of doom ensues. Iron Man's pulling out all of his tricks, repulsor blasts, freaking drop kicking Thanos in the face, all kinds of crazy moves, all for just a drop of blood, as Thanos put it. And then Thanos returned the favor by beating the holy crap out of Tony Stark, even stabbing him horribly. But his backup was there to distract Thanos, and they all got some good licks in, and they kind of all started using their team-up moves and stuff. And Star-Lord did this pretty sweet move where he like used those magnetic devices he had, and he kind of flipped Thanos off and kind of jumped backwards into a Doctor Strange portal. That was really, really cool. It was working perfectly. They all were doing their part. They had Mantis sitting on Thanos' shoulders, and she was kind of overriding his brain, and... While meanwhile, everybody was yanking on the Infinity Gauntlet, you know, and Spider Man was pulling on it, and they were all just pulling on it. Except for Peter Quill, he was grilling Thanos about where Gamora was, and I believe it was Mantis who was able to sense that Gamora was dead and Thanos had killed her. 
And in a scene that was just brutal to watch because you, you could just see it going bad. And you knew that hothead Star-Lord was going to fly off the handle and just ruin everything. And I was pretty much wanting to yell at the screen to just stop because I knew what he was going to do. And of course, he loses his temper, starts beating Thanos in the head, and he accidentally pistol whips Mantis' hand, breaking the connection to Thanos right when Spider-Man had the glove almost off. We're talking fingertips. And Thanos vanishes, leaving them all sitting there looking dumb. And Peter Quill basically goes, Did I do that? So back on Wakanda, the battle is still going strong, and Thor is now joined because he's back, and he brought his insane axe hammer thing, Stormbreaker. We're about two and a half hours into the movie now, and it's chugging along. I mean, some people complain about the length of it, but it really didn't feel that long to me, honestly. It wasn't like a long Lord of the Rings three hours, you know? Uh, Thanos arrives, and then there's that huge battle out in the jungle. And everybody who is still around at this point gets to take pot shots at him. Steve Rogers, I remember, gets a, a lot of licks in on him, but obviously nobody can take him, and everybody just gets dropped by him pretty effortlessly, in fact. Him and Vision square off, and Vision does what he can, but he's still injured from that glaive guy shanking him in the back. And Thanos was able to rip the Infinity Stone right out of poor Vision's freaking head. Circuits and all. And I think this is actually our fourth official death in the movie. I don't think Vision's coming back from that one. Yeah, so that was freaking awful. Uh, then Thor jumps in, right, he was enraged, so Thor jumps in with the, uh, the, the pointy end of his new Stormbreaker axe pick thing, uh, and drives it right into Thanos' chest, uh, and that's when uh, Thanos whispers to him that he should have aimed for the head, and this happened. And Thanos disappeared, and I was like, what the heck, what did that mean? And I think the whole audience was pretty puzzled, actually. Uh, and if I remember correctly, Winter Soldier was the first one to succumb. Bucky tells Captain America something's wrong, and then he falls over, turns to ash, and just disintegrates. Then one by one, all of our heroes start falling. It was freaking insane. We lost Scarlet Witch, Black Panther fell. Then we lost Groot, which was just totally tragic, because Rocket Raccoon had to watch Groot die again. Star-Lord surprisingly died, then Drax and Mantis, so we're like pretty much lost almost all the Guardians of the Galaxy. It's interesting to note that some of the bad guys on the battlefield were disintegrating too, so I mean it's definitely 50% of the whole universe that has to go. Then we go back to Titan, which we see a heartbreaking scene where Spider-Man is crying out to Tony Stark that he doesn't want to die, literally dies in Iron Man's arms. <laughs> at this point my kid is pretty upset. Yeah, I looked over at him and he's got his face half buried in his shirt. So I'm comforting him that they'll most likely be back, and he's obviously not believing me. And then finally, Doctor Strange keels over and bites the dust. Pun absolutely intended. And with that, we come to Thanos, who seems to be chilling on a beach on vacation and smiling. And the movie literally just ends there. Uh, I think that part is, could be left open to interpretation. In the comics, he has a love infatuation with death, Lady Death. If you remember at the end of the first Avengers movie, he smiled when he was told that going after the Avengers would be like courting death. But this movie didn't go into it, so perhaps they're saving all that stuff for part two. So we stuck around till the end credit scene, just like the rest of the theater did, and you're treated to a scene with Nick Fury and Maria Hill driving around. They're discussing who to contact, and I assume they were talking about Hawkeye, considering he'd been MIA in this whole movie. But that's when people start disintegrating around them, and then Maria Hill disintegrates. Nick Fury pulls out the most craziest looking futuristic pager you've ever seen and sends out a message. But before he can even let out a patented Samuel L. Jackson mother he disintegrates too. He drops the contraption and the icon on the screen indicates that he was making a call to Captain Marvel. Hopefully the call got out because they're going to need some cosmic badassery if they're going to stand a chance against Thanos in this next one. Speaking of which, what happened to Adam Warlock? I'm pretty sure they were teasing pretty heavily about that. And while we're also wondering stuff, since Groot disintegrated and died, does that mean the handle of Stormbreaker also disintegrated? What happened to Korg and Valkyrie from Thor Ragnarok? And what in the hell happened to this scene? After everybody turned into Ash, I was thinking, well, it's okay, we still haven't seen where they all charged together in the jungle, because I remember seeing Hulk running through that mother. But if they want to use their trailers to mess with the audience's preconceived notions, I'm all for that. It's much better than what the Terminator Genesis trailer did and completely screw the pooch by spoiling the whole friggin' movie. I guess we'll have to wait to get the answer to this and many more questions when Infinity Wars Part 2 comes out in, what, well over a year? In the meantime, they're just gonna let my kid think Spider-Man died. So I really actually liked this movie. I went into it not really expecting much. I only watched the one trailer. I've kind of had a bad taste in my mouth from Disney after a, a couple meh Marvel movies and then what they're doing with the Star Wars franchise. 
But this movie definitely hit its mark. I thought it was very impactful, very you know sad and funny, you know, and exciting. All the things you really want from a movie. It's a lot to take in. I mean, there's just almost too much for your eyeballs to even comprehend what's going on at some point. So luckily, I get to go see it again sometime this week. We're gonna go check it out on the XL screen. I'll take my wife to go see it. She hadn't seen it yet. Well, that's about it for this one. Thanks for sticking around and listen to me ramble. Feel free to like and subscribe and leave a comment. I'll see you the next time something interesting happens.